Hey everybody, this is Tim with the University of Vinyl. I'm back with another video today. And I am going to be doing the seventh in a continuing series of videos that are featuring, highlighting outstanding mastering engineers. Now, if you're new to the channel, I've done six of these previously that have focused on a single engineer. And I've actually put them in a new playlist um, that people can check out if you haven't seen those before. So far I featured videos um, highlighting Ted Jensen of Sterling Sound, George Marino of Sterling Sound, Wally Talget of Capitol Records, Kent Duncan of uh, Ken Dunn Recorders in Burbank, California. Uh, we've highlighted Doug Sachs from the Mastering Lab. And then most recently, George Porky's Prime Cut Peckham um, the famous UK-based uh, mastering engineer. So I wanted to say, first of all, you know, I started doing these, um, you know, easy records and albums to find that have audiophile quality sound, but they're not from audiophile pressings videos. I, I put one out a little over two months ago and then I did a follow-up sequel. And those two videos uh, featured a smattering of different engineers. Now, with the video that I'm going to be doing today, um, we're going to be featuring Bob Ludwig, probably the King Poobah of mastering engineers, the most famous mastering engineer out there. And I'm going to feature 10 albums uh, that were mastered by Bob. And I've kind of double checked and I wanted to make a point I didn't want to have any repeats so these are 10 fresh albums that I have not shown before uh, you know associated with these mastering uh, videos so I'm, I'm kind of uh, excited to show you those but I wanted to continue on and, and say thank you everybody you know when I started these videos a couple months ago featuring the mastering engineers and the, and the easy to find audiophile pressings I had under 200 subscribers to my channel. Uh, before I hit record today, I did a double check. I'm up to 2,160 subscribers. So I'm blown away by the support, um, all the comments and likes, people that are um, obviously enjoying the video. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, it might sound cliche, but when I started doing these things uh, in, I think, early February, I had no idea that I would even reach 250 subscribers, let alone over 2,000. So, thank you, thank you, thank you, and uh, let's get on with today's show. <laughs> Hey, so before we dive into the actual albums today, let's talk about um, Bob Ludwig's career for a minute. So Bob got his start in the mid-1960s and he was hired on as an assistant to Phil Ramone, famous producer uh, at a and Records in the 1960s. He eventually moved on to Sterling Sound and after leaving Sterling Sound, um, I believe it was in about the mid-1970s, he went on to Master Disc, based in New York City. And Ludwig was incredibly prolific during the 1980s. I have several albums I'm going to feature today that have his telltale mark, uh, the Master Disc stamp, and then the etched RL um, in the Dead Wax. I've got photos of several of these pressings that I'll include today. You can check them out. Um, but the cool thing about all of these albums today, other than a couple, they're still relatively easy to find out there, especially the albums I'm gonna show from the 1980s. They're really easy to find. I recently picked up one of the albums I'm gonna show for $4 in near mint condition. So um, when you're out looking or if you're checking your own collection, you may already have several of these, you may not. Uh, but what I'm what I'm telling you is, for the most part, they're easy to find. And um, as always, I have to preface this and say, 
you want to try and find VG++ to near mint albums for the best experience with your with your systems. Um, okay, after leaving MasterDisk, um, Bob Ludwig went out on his own and formed Gateway Mastering, um, which is based in his home state of Maine, and um, he set up that business in 1993. He's still out there mastering today. He went and um, you know, did a 180 and went away from vinyl into CDs like most of the mastering engineers did that I've talked about. But he is actually back now um, cutting vinyl and um, still very active today. He's, uh, he's one of the very, very best that has ever walked this earth as far as mastering is concerned. And I'm uh, really happy today to uh, finally give him his own video. So here we go. In 1973, there was a very attractive young couple um, from the Bay Area in California. And they eventually managed to get a recording contract. Um, this was uh, a singer-songwriter, incredible guitar player, and his girlfriend with an amazing voice and stage pre well, she would eventually demonstrate her stage presence. Of course, I'm talking about um, Buckingham Nicks. This is the album that was released in 1973, produced by the prolific, very talented producer Keith Olsen. Uh, this really kind of set the groundwork for what would come later. And, you know, legend has it that during the recording of this album, which took place in uh, legendary studio Sound City in the Valley, in the L.A. area, Mick Fleetwood uh, was in another room. I think they were working on one of the final Fleetwood Mac albums featuring Bob Welch. And Fleetwood knew that he was going to be needing a new guitarist and was wondering what to do with the Fleetwood Mac, you know, moving on after Welch. And he heard Lindsey Buckingham playing lead guitar um, in the recording of this album and introduced himself and kind of the rest is history. Now, legend has it that Fleetwood originally just wanted Lindsey Buckingham in the band, but Buckingham um, insisted on taking along his girlfriend Stevie Nicks and as they say, the rest is history. Um, these two have had a topsy-turvy relationship, as everybody knows. Um, currently, I think they're back on the Alps. Um, so who knows what's going to happen? You know, is there going to be another Fleetwood Mac reunion, kind of an end-all, be-all final tour? Uh, I don't think we'll see another album um, with Fleetwood Mac with these guys on it, but. Who knows? Um, stranger things have happened. Anyway, this is a gatefold album. It is not easy to find. It's on the Polydor label. Um, look for the Sterling stamp and, of course, the etched RL in the dead wax, and you'll know that you have the right copy. There's another shot of the couple from 1973. Outstanding group of songs. Um, you know, when, when these guys eventually, in 1975, were in Fleetwood Mac and they put out that white album, the self-titled Fleetwood Mac album, you can, you can make, from point A to point B, you can make that connection so very easily. Uh, these, this is a very, very strong set of songs and uh, recording is really fantastic. Great separation of instruments in this, good dynamics and a lot of great bass actually. Um, incidentally, a couple great players on this album. Jerry Sheff uh, played bass on most of the songs, I think. Jerry Sheff was the bass player for Elvis, you know, during Elvis's uh, touring years in the 1970s. And then you've got the great drummer, Jim Keltner, um, on this album as well. So there it is, Buckingham Nicks, 1973, mastered by Bob Ludwig. In 1985, British singer Brian Ferry put out Boys and Girls. This is an incredible album. The recording is 
it just sounds pristine. Of course, mastered by Bob Ludwig. This was, um, I'm, it, I'm going to put the argument out there that uh, I think this is the high water mark for Brian Ferry. Um, of course, this had Slave to Love, um, Don't Stop the Dance, two outstanding tracks, and he actually, uh, there's actually a credit there for Ludwig. If you can see that on the back uh, inner sleeve, mastered by Bob Ludwig, that master disc. There is an all-star group of players on this album too. Um, people like David Gilmore on guitar. Um, who else was on this? I could have a few notes. Niall Rogers, David Sanborn, uh, the great jazz guitarist Omar Hakim is on here as well. Sounds great. 1985, Boys and Girls, Brian Ferry. Great album. In 1986, the leader of the Cars, Rick Ocasek, put out his second solo album. And that album is This Side of Paradise. And, you know, this album could be a continuation of the cars. If you did not know it and you listen to this album, you might think, get it? <laughs> you might think that this is actually a cars album. And a true fact on this album, all of the cars are on here except for David Robinson. So we had Elliot Easton with a very, very tasty guitar solo on one of these songs. Um, Greg Hawks co-wrote one of the songs on the album and is all over. All of his keyboard effects and sequencers um, are on this album. Um, ben Orr singing backup vocals on many of the songs as well. So everybody, all the cars are on this and if you listen to this album, it kind of sounds like a continuation of Heartbeat City, you know, which came two years prior to the release of this album. So, give it a listen if you don't have it. This is pretty easy to find, relatively inexpensive. Um, it's on that, that gorgeous black Geffen label. It's got the master disc and uh, stamp in the RL etching uh, as well. Keep on Laughing is a great song. Uh, of course, Emotion in Motion huge MTV video hit and I actually think that song actually went to number one on the Billboard charts maybe briefly um, but this is a very very strong album and if you don't have it you need to get it. In 1975 there was a English singer-songwriter who put out his second album and this guy was known for being a storyteller in his songs. They almost had a cinematic quality. Almost, you know, the songs were kind of known as like mini movies. And this guy hit pay dirt four years later in 1979 with a huge hit, um, which, you know, it was a bit of a double-edged sword for Rupert Holmes. Um, this is the 1975 self-titled album this was mastered uh, at Master Disc by Bob Ludwig. And there are no hits on this album, I'll tell you that right now. However, there is just, it's a really, really finely crafted pop album. Well 
well-written songs, funny lyrics, and, uh, you know, Rupert Holmes was a lot more than, than the Pina Colada song, in my opinion. And um, this is a really, really fine album, and um, I think it's pretty easy to find. Cool thing about this album, I actually have the white label promo, and that is on Epic Records. But uh, if you if you only know Rupert Holmes for the Pina Colada song, I think you're missing out on a lot. Um, see if you can find this album. It's well worth uh, listening to, and it sounds amazing. Mastered by Bob Ludwig. Okay, in 1980, uh, this is one of the big ones, by the way. <laughs> in 1980, there was a dark but incredible album released by none other than Steely Dan. And most people know what we're talking about. We're talking about Gaucho. There is that gorgeous cover. And Gaucho was a problematic album for, for uh, Fagan and Becker. This is the follow-up to Asia and after Asia came out and the huge success that they had, um, there was a bit of a tug of war between the old label ABC Records and MCA. And there was a lot of legal wranglings. MCA bought out ABC. Becker and Fagan thought that they were no longer um, beholden to ABC or MCA. Lawsuits were filed, things went to court, it took a long time, and the court ruled that Becker and Fagan would be putting out their next album on MCA Records, which was to be eventually Gaucho. So you had that kind of a backdrop, a bunch of legal proceedings that the guys did not like, uh, a, major, a major bummer, a major hassle. And on top of that, that kind of soured their view. You know, these guys were in Los Angeles for years and they decided to decamp and go to New York. So they moved to Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Both of them were living there and started uh, promising recording sessions for Gaucho. They had worked up a bunch of fantastic songs and one of the legendary songs that they had worked up and finished was called The Second Arrangement. So legend has it, The Second Arrangement was a killer song. You can actually go listen to a demo. Poorly, poor quality, but it's out, it's out there on YouTube. And back to the story, there was an assistant engineer who was charged with making a dupe copy of the final mix onto another tape so that it could be presented to Donald and Walter for their final approval as far as it being done and it's going to be tracked for somewhere on the album. Apparently what happened is the assistant engineer instead of copying the tape he erased three quarters of the song and you know, there was something on Facebook last summer um, from Roger Nichols, a uh, famous uh, producer, engineer for Steely Dan, has got a Facebook page. He passed away in 2011. I think his daughter is running it now. But supposedly they found another pristine copy of the second arrangement, although you know, there were thoughts that the tape had been degraded. I haven't heard anything about it since. Anyway, so Donald Fagan was so upset when he heard what had happened, he stormed out of the studio and it took him several days to come back. And the band tried to, and, and all the players, I mean, the band at that point in time was Donald Fagan and Walter Becker. Right, They had disbanded their touring band years before 
and um, had moved on as a studio band only. Um, but anyway, the story is that Fagan had stormed out. They eventually tried to re-record, recreate the magic of the second arrangement. They were not able to, to finish it. Re remember, these guys are perfectionists, right? They're legendary. And... Uh, they weren't able. They weren't able to kind of find the magic that they thought they had with the first mixed down version of the second arrangement. So it was scrapped. The cool thing, the cool end to the story with the second arrangement is they needed another song, and the song that would eventually take the place of the second arrangement was "Third World Man," one of my favorite songs on this album. It closes side two. An epic song, and it features incredible guitar work by Larry Carlton. This was a leftover song that they reworked up. Um, it was left over from the Royal Scam Sessions. So, kind of an amazing story the way it all worked out. Now, keep in mind, I was talking about Dark. Um, Walter Becker was going through some things during the recording of this album after they had moved back to New York. He had a growing drug issue, heroin, cocaine. And one day after working at the studio, he went back to his Upper West Side apartment and found his girlfriend dead of a heroin overdose. Becker was eventually sued by his girlfriend's parents. They, it, it was horrible. It got, it got very ugly, and they eventually settled out of court. Three months after Becker's girlfriend died, Walter stepped off a curb, I think it was on Broadway on the Upper West Side, and was hit by a taxi, and his right leg was shattered. So we had all of that going on during the recording of this album. It eventually proved to be too much for Donald and Walter. That was, you know, this album came out and what a gorgeous, incredible album this is. But this this was the end of Steely Dan until 1993, right? Um, Walter ended up moving to Hawaii, kicking drugs there, um, famously becoming an avocado farmer. And um, Becker signed with Warner Brothers and came out with The Nightfly in 1982. Also mastered by Bob Ludwig, I I shall say, <laughs> although I'm not going to show that album today. Um, personally, I love this album. It has uh, some memories for me. You know, um, about 30 years ago, I spent a year in L.A., first year out of college, kind of floundering around, and um, had a job. I was actually in Beverly Hills, and I remember I would put this album on, um, I would slide in the CD on the way home from work sometimes, and I would actually be headed <laughs> west on sunset, just like Babylon Sisters, and um, would kind of decompress from, from work, and I would have a small smile on my face as I cruised west on sunset. Anyway, this is an incredible album by Steely Dan. And you want to be looking for that rainbow MCA label. And the master disc stamp is on side one with the RL etching. Steely Dan Gaucho 1980. A Bob Ludwig mastering extravaganza. One more thing about Gaucho. I think it took over two years to finish that album. 42 studio musicians, um, including Mark Knopfler, uh, Victor Feldman, uh, ton tons of players, <laughs> 11 engineers, and nearly a million dollars uh, on the recording. All that booked studio time. So, incredible, especially if you think about nearly a million dollars in 1980 money compared to what that is today. In 1988, that band from Athens, Georgia had decided 
um, that they were going to sign with a major label. They had come to the end of the road with IRS Records, and that first album that came out on Warner, of course, is um, Green by R.E.M., which is an amazing album. And, you know, if you like R.E.M. with a slice of politics, this was the one um, that came out in 88. You know, this was just as the Cold War was ending. The Soviet Union was no more. The Berlin Wall was coming down. There are themes of all of that in this album. Um, it's got that cool orange Warner Brothers label. My two favorite songs on this album are World Leader Pretend and Hair Shirt. Um, I have another favorite. You Are The Everything. Gorgeous song. This is a another cliche. This is a tour de force. And you know you had Bill Berry still in the band at that point. These guys were firing on all cylinders and I remember they had kind of an iconic tour. Michael Stipe um, was using the megaphone, um, mastered by Bob Ludwig as well. Check it out. So in 1981, the Rolling Stones came out with Tattoo You. This is an iconic Rolling Stones album, and it's a little bit of an anomaly. You know, at that point in time, the story goes that Keith and Mick were not getting along, but it was time to put out a new album. It had been some time, you know, some girls came out in 1978. So, you know, we're, we're three years down the line when Tattoo You came out. And apparently what they did, some of the handlers and engineers went back and checked the vaults as far as backing tracks, song fragments, and most of this album is made up of songs that were reworked up, reconfigured, going all the way back to Goat's Head Soup. And when I think about this album, to me, it's all about side two. You know, side one starts with Start Me Up, of course. You've got Little TNA, you've got Black Limousine, but I think side two is the stronger side that's kind of known as the ballad side. Um, first song on side two is Worried About You. And that was a leftover from the Black and Blue sessions. Um, they had hired Wayne Perkins um, to play lead guitar on that album. Um, him along with Keith, of course. And Worried About You features a gorgeous solo by Wayne Perkins. Um, also, Billy Preston is on electric piano, and it's just it's just a beautiful track. I play this on my system, and it just sounds amazing. There is a master disc stamp on both sides with an etched RL on both sides. That's what you want to find. Um, there are nine RL versions out there, and I don't think they sound as good. So that's what you're looking for. And um, this is a great Rolling Stones album. Okay, so in 1981, we had a band from San Francisco, California, release a new album called Escape Journey. Everybody knows this album. This thing was laden with hits. I have an early pressing that actually has a very, very nice embossed um, cover. And this is another master disc, Bob Ludwig cut. This features, of course, Don't Stop Believing, the monster hit that actually had a second life. Remember, it was featured in the final scene of The Sopranos. Um, I think that was in that was in 2007. You know, I need to go and rewatch The Sopranos again. I missed out on some of it. Um, however, back to this album, Tour de Force, right? 
Um, we lost, Journey lost Greg Raleigh the year before. He told the guys he was done with Journey. So they needed another keyboard player. They brought in Jonathan Kane, who had been with the Babies. This would be the first album with Steve Perry singing lead vocal on every song. Raleigh and, and Perry had shared those duties for a couple albums. And no matter what you think about this iteration of Journey, um, Steve Perry was at the top of his game. What an incredible voice. Um, I don't know what else I can say about it, but if you want to add this album to your collection, if you don't already have it, make sure you get an early pressing. You can tell by the embossed cover, and Ludwig is credited uh, on the inner sleeve as being the mastering engineer. By the way, there is no South Detroit, okay? <laughs> um, South Detroit is, it's either going to be the Detroit River or Windsor, Canada. There is no South Detroit. Okay, we're going to move the clock up to 1988. And in 1988, that beloved crotchety genius singer, songwriter, composer, Randy Newman came out with Land of Dreams. I thought it was Land of Dreams. <laughs> and this is a fantastic album. You can find this very easily for not much money. Check out that $4 price tag that I picked this up uh, a couple years ago. This is a cool record because uh, Dixie Flyer and It's Money That Matters are two songs on the album produced by Mark Knopfler. And if you listen to those two songs closely, you would think these are Dire Straits songs. They could have been on a Dire Straits album. Um, and they sound incredible, but I do love Randy Newman's voice. Of course, he wrote all the lyrics, all the music for this. Knopfler, you know, helped, of course, with guitar and production duties. There's another song on the album actually produced by Jeff Lynn. Um, what's the name of that song? It's Falling in Love. It's on side one. And on that song, we have Tom Petty and Mike Campbell on guitar. Jeff Lynn is playing bass. Newman's on piano, of course, lead vocal. And Phil Jones is on drums. So if you think about it, 1988, Jeff Lynn, Tom Petty, Mike Campbell, Phil Jones. Remember, those guys were working on Full Moon Fever at the very same time. And Petty is actually singing backup vocals also on the chorus of It's Money That Matters along with a host of other people. Um, hey, this is a strong Randy Newman album. I think it's a little bit kind of forgotten in time. Um, and it sounds amazing. Of course, mastered by Bob Ludwig. Go find it. It's time to show the 10th album. Hey, I've just scraped the surface today as far as Bob Ludwig is concerned. There is a 41-page thread on the Steve Hoffman forum listing out tons and tons of artists and titles that you will recognize if you check out the thread. And it's fun to go look, check your collection. You might have a lot of these Bob Ludwig cuts already. Um, so what, what to do with the 10th album? There are a lot of directions I could have went with this, but I decided to go back and show this 1984 iconic album, which is Born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Really easy to find. Millions and millions and millions of these albums were sold. This sounds great. Um, this album, to me... It's all about side two, the first two songs on side two, No Surrender and Bobby Jean. They both t 
touch me in different ways. They're, they're just fantastic songs. This was a huge album for Bruce Springsteen. I think they toured, they toured this album for like three years. Just incredible. Touring leg after touring leg, Europe, North America, South America. I think they went everywhere. And this is just a huge, huge record. Um, remember, this came after kind of the sparse Bruce Solo acoustic Nebraska album. So a whole 180, he brought back the E Street Band. Some of the sax solos um, by Clarence are amazing on this thing. Um, and that, you know, that, that can bring your emotions up. Clarence is no longer with us. Um, anyway, that's the 10th album I'm gonna feature today. Um, mastered by the great Bob Ludwig. But, <laughs> there's an elephant in the room, right? And I may have fibbed a little bit when I said I wasn't going to show any repeat albums. But when we talk about Bob Ludwig, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. And that's the Led Zeppelin II hot cut. And I promised myself I wasn't going to go deep on this, and I'm not today. Go check out two videos ago. I did a whole Led Zeppelin video, and this whole album and the story behind Bob Ludwig's Hot Cut is in that video. Uh, but anyway, this is where Bob Ludwig kind of, his name hit the map, and everyone in the VC knows about this, I think. But I'm here to tell you it's possible to find these in the wild. I found this two months ago. Um, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about this again. <laughs> anyway, keep the faith, everybody. See if you can go find this album. Um, if I ever need $700 or $1,000, I can throw this up on the bay and see what happens, but I have no intention of doing that. This thing sounds freaking amazing. <laughs> That's it. That's the Bob Ludwig episode. Thanks, everybody. Stay tuned. I'm going to have another video coming out midweek, right before, for us Americans, the 4th of July weekend. Enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.